Good evening. I can't tell you what a joy it is to get to share the word with you guys this morning and this evening. I'm so grateful. Would you open up the word to Daniel chapter 1, please? We are going to be actually in the same eight verses that we were in this morning. So Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. But we'll be focusing on a different part of it. Focusing on a completely different theme that shows up more towards the end of this passage this time, whereas this morning we focused on the theme from the first few verses of this chapter. So let's go ahead and read together verses 1 through 8, book of Daniel, chapter 1, and then we'll take a look and see what the Lord would say to us through it. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Let's actually go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you this evening with, in a special sense of of our great dependence on you, a sense of our need. Father, I confess I can do nothing apart from you. None of us can. I can't teach your word rightly apart from you. And your people can't receive it even and apply it and live it apart from you. Every part of this worship service is fully dependent upon you. And we are glad for that. And we look to you to make use of it for your glory. Lord, that is the cry of our hearts. Come and let your Holy Spirit work mightily through this sermon. Bless your people and call anyone in this place who is not yet a part of your people into that family. We ask for it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, there are times when the adversary, Satan, tries to turn God's people away from God through things like pain and persecution. And we saw an example of that this morning, didn't we? From the first few verses of Daniel in the catastrophe that Nebuchadnezzar brought on God's people in Israel, in Judah. And we talked about and we saw How we, of course, are faced with that same pain and persecution in different ways as we see evil seeming to grow and triumph in the world and in our lives around us. But there are other times where Satan takes a completely different strategy. He's still trying to turn God's people away from him. But instead of using pain and persecution... He uses pleasure and temptation. 
And that is more of the kind of attack that Daniel faced. Yes, he certainly knew persecution and pain in that initial departure from his family and the destruction of his city. But once he arrived in Babylon, then it was all about pleasure and seduction to try to convert him into a Babylonian citizen and a Babylonian worshiper. And you know, I don't even have to say it, that Satan is using that same strategy today. In your life, in my life, in everyone's life, he uses both. He uses every kind of way that he can. And so the question that we're going to answer tonight is the how question. Because you see, did it work on Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah? It didn't, did it? His tactics didn't work. In fact, they completely and miserably failed. They were stunning examples of faithfulness to God in a godless culture. And we need to see how. How were they able to do that? We know that it's God's grace without a doubt, right? But how was God's grace at work in their life that enabled it? That's what we're looking at. But before we can answer that question, how we have to quickly see just how difficult this situation was. If we're going to appreciate what God did in and through them, we've got to see how tough it would have been to be in their shoes. And so let's go think through the verses we just read. We won't read through every word, but in verses three and four, we saw that they were far from home. When I taught my students through this book a few years ago, the, point, or the way I put that point is that their parents were gone. Same idea. The idea here is that every positive influence in their life is now removed from the picture. Every influence that would have been pointing them to obedience, faithfulness to God was now gone. Just think about how difficult that is. Think about how Many times, accountability has saved you and saved me from evil. The presence of another believer in the moment of temptation makes all the difference, doesn't it? It's huge. Or how about just this? How about just knowing that another believer or someone, especially someone dear to you, would find out? How often does that keep us from wandering into foolishness? Daniel didn't have any of that. Aren't secret temptations the hardest? When no one else would know but God. Isn't that the most challenging kind? For Daniel and his friends, virtually every temptation was like that, a secret temptation. Because no one who cared would know, and no one who would know would care. That's the kind of temptation we're going to be talking about tonight. This will apply, the things we're going to learn, the principles we're going to learn would apply to every temptation, but we're specifically going to be talking about that. Those most difficult of attacks. Where it's you, God, and the enemy. But not only was he far from home and removed from every positive influence, also the strength of this temptation. The temptation was a strong one. And we see that in verse 5. We'll go ahead and read that where it says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. Now this is going to sound like a joke, but I'm serious. Have you ever tried to diet? It's not easy. It's really hard to stick to a strict diet. I know, because I'm supposed to be on one. (laughs) For me, it lasts until the next time my wife cooks a good meal that I want to eat, that I'm not supposed to, and that's where the diet dies. Or we go to Guadalajara's after service on a Sunday afternoon. It dies a bloody death. If it was easy, more people would be able to live healthily, eat healthily. It's hard. 
But not only was Daniel having to control what he ate and continually controlled what he ate throughout the entire three years of his training, but he was being offered literally the best food in the world. You're talking about the emperor of one of, if not the greatest empire on earth at the time. He eats the best of anyone in the world. Emperor's food. Emperor's drink. We tend to think of this as no, you know, not too big of a deal. This would have been an incredibly difficult temptation to resist. Instead, eating vegetables meal after meal after meal. Presumably because the way that they prepared food would not have been in keeping with the way that God commanded them to as part of the Jewish dietary laws. So that's the motivation. That's how he's honoring God through this. That's why he's making this choice. So this temptation is very strong, but I would also emphasize that this is really just one of the myriad of temptations that Daniel would have faced in Babylon. This is just one example, isn't it? Maybe it was even picked because it seems to be a small, what would have been a small compromise maybe. It seems like it would have been a small compromise to do this in compared to something like full-scale idolatry or immorality. And so I think perhaps this example is set before us to show that not in any way was Daniel willing to compromise. Especially, once again, especially amazing considering this was a young man between 13 and 17 years old. When you need to eat, let's be honest, more than vegetables. Probably a miracle that he was able to get fat on this diet. This was not a health decision. This was a conscience decision, a glorifying God decision. So he's far from home. He's faced with incredibly strong temptation. And then finally, in verses six through seven, the pressure from outside was outside of him, these external influences was turned on, but not in a good way. The pressure to conform was on. We talked about a little this morning, so I won't get too far into it, but remember, they're trying to do everything they can to obligate Daniel to fall in line. They're giving him the best education, once again, at this time, probably in the world. And they're giving him the best dainties and pleasures in the world. In this food and wine that's being offered to him. And the expectation is you don't ask questions. You don't step out of line. You take what you're given and you be grateful for it. I mean, can't you just eat the food? Can't you just drink the wine? What is the big deal? Do you see all that this king has done for you? He could have left you in Israel to rot. He could have made you a slave. He's elevated you. He's training you to stand by his side in the king's palace and be his advisor. And you're going to put up a fit about the food? You can see how this pressure would have come. But the names there in verses 6 and 7 is such a key. It's such another evidence of this pressure that Daniel must have felt to conform. I mentioned this morning that they were changed from names that represented their God to names that represented other gods. I'll fill you in on that now in case you're wondering. You see at the end of the name Daniel, there's that L, that E-L. That's a shortened form of Elohim. That is the word God in his name. His name means God is my judge. You can see, and then in Hananiah, it ends with that A-H. That's a shortened form of Yahweh. That's, that stands for the Lord. And Hananiah is Yahweh is gracious. And the other two, you can see at the end of their names, once again, there's an L in the end of Mishael and an A-H at the end of Azariah. Their names mean who is like God and the Lord helps. What did they change their names to? 
You can see the names of their foreign gods in the names they changed, that they were changed to. Belteshazzar, that B-E-L, sort of the Babylonian version of the god Baal that the Philistines worship that you're probably very familiar with. So Bel to Shazar probably means Baal or Bel provides. Then we have, um, what comes next here? Uh, Shadrach, the command of Aku, that Ak at the end of the name is Aku. Then we have Meshach, who is like Aku, from who is like God to who is like Aku. And then with Abednego, Servant of Nebo, which was another one of their gods, I believe, that was supposed to be the son of Baal, of Bel. You see how deliberate this was? Flipping their names, reversing their names, saying, no, you're not even allowed to call yourself by the name of your God anymore, let alone hold on to his laws. You've got new gods and new laws. So he's far from home, No external influence pushing him to do what's right. Every external influence pressuring him to do what's wrong. And to top it all off, a most appealing temptation in front of his face. Really, I don't, it's hard to imagine a more difficult temptation. It really is. Does this situation remind you of anything that, any life circumstances that we face today? How about college? How about going to college? Get them far from home. Let's put the strongest temptations we can right there in front of their face, the most appealing seductions that we can. And then let's pressure them. Turn up the pressure, whether it be from professors or whether it be from other peers, students. This is the same recipe in college that Satan's using that he's used for thousands of years. I'm not anti-college. I'm not saying don't send your kids to college. It's not the point. But the point is that if that is you, and I'm glad this happened on Senior Recognition Day, and I know some of you are here, this is particularly applicable for you. This applies to your situation maybe more than the rest of us. But... Every one of us knows this kind of temptation, wherever it is that all external motivations to obey God's commands have been removed from the picture, and the temptation before you is appealing. That's the kind of temptation that we're talking about tonight. And every one of you knows where you deal with that kind of temptation. And so the question is, how in the world were they able to resolve not to defile themselves, and how in the world can we? And I think the answer, which I'll share now here about the midway point, and then we'll unpack the rest of the sermon, I think the answer actually can be found in that word used in verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. He resolved. Not just the fact that to resolve to follow God is important, to make an actual commitment is important. That's true. We could preach on that. I have preached on that actually this year, but that's not what I'm getting at. What that word translated resolve, what it literally says is he set it in his heart, set it or put it in his heart. I think the King James Version, which is a very literal translation, actually gets it the best when it says Daniel purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart. You see, the only hope of standing firm in that kind of isolated temptation is the power of the internal motivations of the heart that God places in every child of his that is born again. What else can save you in that moment? 
when everything on the outside would only force you to sin, what is going to stop you and stop me? The internal motivations of the heart that are there as a result of the new birth. It's the only way. It's the only way. And namely, we could talk about many of these. We could talk about, how about believing that what God says is best, really is best. I think that's one of the themes of the school here, isn't it, Joe? Here y'all say that all the time. How about that internal belief? How about a desire, a deep, true desire in the heart to glorify God above all things? God, what I want more than to satisfy myself is to glorify you with my life. But the two we're going to focus on tonight are actually not those. Perhaps the two biggest, most constant, most important is very simple. It's the love of God and the fear of God. The love of God and the fear of God will save you, must save you. It's our only hope. How in the world do they do that? It's really very simple. You see, when you love someone, and you know this to be true in human relationships, when you truly love someone, you want to please them and you don't want to grieve them. Isn't that right? Think about your relationship with your spouse if you're married. Think about the relationship you have with your children. Think about your relationship with your parents. If you truly love someone, man, what you want more than anything is to make them proud. And the last thing that you want to do in that relationship is to grieve my wife, my children, my father, This is even true of unbelievers. You know that an unbeliever who loves his wife, maybe not, obviously not perfectly, maybe not in the way that a Christian man can, yet still who has some love for his wife, will actually very often remain faithful to his wife his whole life long because he doesn't want her to know of any infidelity which would not please her but grieve her. This motivates even the lost. How much more should it motivate a believer to be faithful to our God and Father? Because we want to please Him and not grieve Him. And so every time that we find ourselves in one of these isolated temptations, what we really find ourselves in is a test of love. It's really a test of our love for God. I challenge you to think of it that way. The next time you're faced with that kind of temptation, to think of it that way. Is every temptation, in a sense, a test of our love for the Lord? In a sense, yes. But I think what we have when we have no reason other than these internal motivations, we have an even purer test. You know you're not obeying to please man. You know you're not obeying for wrong reasons. There's only one reason. Do you want to please him? Do you hate to grieve him? Is he your father whom you love? Is he your savior whom you love? Is he the spirit whom you love? And if you have been failing the test, there's more than one reason why that may be. If you've been falling into temptation that no one else knows about or no believers, maybe at work they know, but they don't care. Maybe at school they know, but they don't care. Maybe your friends know, but they don't care. But if you've been falling into these, it could be, and we, I, I hope this is not the case tonight, but it could be that maybe you never have truly known what it is to love God. I'm not saying that is the reason. I'm saying that's a possible reason. That's a possible reason. Especially if you've never known what it is to be face-to-face with a temptation, isolated from those who would influence you positively, and to make the decision that pleases God because it pleases God. If that thought does not even cross your mind, has not crossed your mind, if you've never known what it is to choose to obey out of love, 
that's a good indication that maybe your heart has never been changed at all. Maybe what you need tonight is to have a heart change. Maybe you need to ask God to change you from the inside out. And if that's you, I urge you to do it and not to put it off. Right now, you can even begin talking to him in the quietness of your heart. Lord, that's me. Will you change my heart? And of course, you probably know this, but I would remind you, that change of heart, it only happens one way. It only happens as we trust in Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. You see, regeneration and faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior, go hand in hand. Always together, always. And so you cry out to him asking him to change your heart even while you place your faith in Jesus to do so. But maybe that is something that you've known. You've known what it is to love God and follow him out of love. And yet you've been falling lately. Could it be because in that moment of temptation, you're not giving love a chance? And here's what I mean by that. You're not even stopping to think. You know, one of Satan's greatest tools is thoughtlessness. What does he want more than anything in that moment of temptation? What is he playing upon? It's your instincts. It's your flesh. It's your unreasoning instincts. It's your fleshly desires. And thoughtfulness is your greatest ally. If he can get you to rush into sin, then it won't really matter whether you love the Lord because you've never even stopped to think, This won't please my Savior. This is going to grieve my God. Reason is always on your side. As a Christian, reason is always on your side. But it also could be that we are simply weak and sometimes our love fails, doesn't it? We can genuinely love God and for the most part make decisions out of that love for him, a desire to please him and not to grieve him. But you know what? We're not perfected yet. Our love fails. We can forget about our love for God in a moment, can't we? We can be blinded by sin and make foolish choices and then later on remember our love for God and regret it. Don't we know that experience? And it's in moments like that, that the fear of God, when our love of God fails, that the fear of God can save ourselves. You see, the fear of God is honestly something I think we overcomplicate so often. When we were children, Wouldn't it have been great if we made every right decision that we made because of how much we loved our parents? Wouldn't that be phenomenal? I would love for my my children to make every decision, every right decision, just because they love me and want to please me and they hate to grieve me. That would be great. But is it real? Is that why you always made the choices you made growing up? Or in the moments when your love for your parents failed, did sometimes the fear of your parents catch you? I know that was the case many times for me. Maybe you didn't have parents who disciplined you growing up, and maybe you don't even know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How is that any different than our relationship with God? Man, wouldn't it be perfect if the love of God was all we needed? That's how it should be. But we're broken and we're foolish and we forget the love that he has poured out in our hearts. And it's at moments like that that his, the fear of him is meant, designed to catch us from hurting ourselves by running into sin. 
It's like I tell my kids, God spanks a lot harder than daddy does. And with the amount that, we won't go into it, we certainly could, but with the amount that the word of God talks about the concept of discipline, both in straightforward teaching and in examples over and over again, like the one we saw in this passage, here's what is revealed. Is that when we choose to engage in something, that we would not engage in in the presence of man. We know in that moment that we fear man more than God. Because we're supposed to believe that God is there. And I tell those that I counsel with this all the time, perhaps if they're struggling with a secret sin, I say, if I were there, if I were looking over your shoulder, would you be able to say no? Because so often what I hear is, I just can't seem to say no. And every single time without fail, the answer has been, yeah, I could. I could do what's right. If you were there, I would be too ashamed not to. I would be too afraid not to. And you feel, you take me, I'm not counseling with all of you guys, obviously, but you take me and you replace it with whoever it may be. It doesn't matter the person. It could be your wife, your spouse, your husband, if you're a woman, your children, your friend, your pastor Richard. And if it's something that you would not do in their presence, but you would do in the presence of God Almighty, listen, there's no other explanation. You fear that person more than God, period. In that moment, you are fearing that person more than God. And that's a convicting, but an eye-opening thing. And so what do you do? if you feel like your fear of God is failing. I say the same thing as I did about love. You ask why. What is happening here when the fear of God should catch me and it isn't? Why? Is it because I've never known the fear of the Lord? Is it because that thought has never kept me from sin? I quote it often, I hate to sound like a broken record, but when you discipline God, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. That verse terrifies me. Maybe that's why I use it so much. Because I have some things in my life I hold pretty dear to me. And God cares more about my holiness than in the preservation of those things. You consume like a moth what is dear to him. If you've never known that kind of holy terror, maybe you've never been taught that God is a God, he's a good father who disciplines, or maybe it's that, once again, you've never had your heart changed to really believe this stuff. Maybe your need, once again, is to cry out for that heart change tonight. To realize I've never had internal motivations to obey. All the motivations I have to obey are external. And that's why every time I'm put in an isolated temptation, I fall. He can save you. He can turn you around. He can make you a man with totally new motivations and desires. Through the power of at work in in the Holy Spirit, in your heart, when you trust in Him. And like I said earlier, trust in His Son who came to forgive you, to provide forgiveness for all of those secret sins. The 
But sometimes, like with love, our fear just simply fails us. It's weak, and we forget who God is and how much respect he is truly owed. And so I want to end with just a few practical ways that we can refocus on the love and fear of God so that we might be prepared for whatever temptations come our way this week. And you know there will be some. And the first thing is very, very simple. It's simply this. Refocus on the basics of what Christianity is. Refocus on your relationship with God. There may be many people in here who don't need to hear this exhortation tonight, but there may be some who do. Refocus on your relationship with God because it can become so easy to make Christianity all about the beautiful things that come along with it. You can make Christianity all about all the parts church doing the right things doing your bible study every day can even become just a routine prayer can even become just a habit now i'm not saying routines and habits are bad but they are if it's just a routine and just a habit and it can be about If I do A, B, C, then I'm walking with God. Are you really focused on what Christianity is in its essence? At the core, it is a relationship with a holy and good God through his son, Jesus Christ. It is knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the heart of Christianity. And in order to do that, I give you this. Refocus on the cross. Refocus on the cross because as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he says the love of Christ constrains us, you've heard that no doubt many times. He says, having determined this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. You see, where... This idea that the love of God controls us, constrains us, keeps us following and serving him. What is the motivation that fueled that? Or what is the thought, I should say, that fueled that throughout his life? It's this determination that Jesus Christ died for all. Therefore, I have died to myself and I live for him. The cross brings us back into focus of that relationship with Jesus Christ and into focus of wanting to please him and not live for the things and end the things that he died to set us free from. Remember the nail-pierced hands. Remember the nail-pierced feet. Remember the side that was pierced by the spear. Remember the wrath of God poured out upon the sun every day. Set your focus again upon that awful, terrible, and yet Glorious moment. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, setting aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's how we set aside those weights and those sins. But I also encourage you, don't just look to the judgment that took place on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. But I also encourage you, focus on the judgment that is to come. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, it says this, after talking about the meaning of life, he says, the end of the matter is this, all all has been heard, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole end of man. But then do you know what he says? How do you fear God and keep his commandments? For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret deed. You see, if Jesus Christ was with us in the flesh, 
then just like if I or anyone else were with you in the flesh, it truly would help us because it's so hard to believe that Jesus is really with us in the person of the Holy Spirit sometimes. But one day you will stand before Jesus in the flesh. He will be seated on a throne. We will give an account for every moment of our lives. This account will take into account not just our actions, but our words, our thoughts, our attitudes, even unchecked desires. And every secret thing will be laid bare. And I don't know about you, but that thought is a sobering one to me. And you will not be punished for your sins on that day because Jesus Christ has taken all condemnation for your sins. But Paul does say you will receive loss. What does he mean by that? Loss of eternal reward. And let's not pretend like that doesn't motivate us because I guarantee you if I gave you a million dollars or if I told you that you just lost a million dollars for choosing evil over good, it would motivate you. Wouldn't it? You'd be pretty upset. So let's not pretend to be so holy that that thought of losing eternal reward doesn't motivate us. It ought to. If it doesn't, then you undervalue eternal reward because God rewards a lot better than a million dollars. And so this, this is one way that we refocus on our relationship with Jesus Christ. This is one way that we strengthen our love and our fear for our God who has saved us is that we live our lives in the midst of two judgments and we keep our mind set as we walk through this life on the judgment that came before wherein all of our sins were destroyed upon the cross, the punishment forever taken away and yet also keeping in mind that day that we will stand before God and give an account for the life that he gave us and allowed us to live as his servants. We see we've got to use this passage as a mirror. We've got to hold, our, hold it up to us and see ourselves in it. And we've got to ask ourselves, what would I do in Daniel's shoes? And the answer is this. How are you doing where you face similar situations right now? And that will tell you exactly what you would have done in Daniel's shoes. And if to any degree God is enabling you to stand in those isolated temptations, if he is giving you victory, then let's thank God for that because that's his work, amen? He began it when he saved us and he's been growing us and sanctifying us. So let's be grateful that he's doing that, that he's working like that in us. And, but let's also at the same time prepare ourselves and be ready because Satan's tests, and in a sense, God's tests, in the sense that he is sovereign and regulates them, they will not end until our life on earth ends. And he will not leave you alone until you have a perfected love and a perfected fear, until you die and stand before Christ face to face or Christ returns. But love and fear of God in those moments will see us through. May God build those things in an ever-increasing way in our lives. Let's ask him to do that. Father in heaven, we come before you just so aware of how many times our love and our fear have truly failed. Just like Peter who denied you three times and we know that Peter did love you, and yet he forgot that love for a moment, and he focused on his fears. 
Lord, we've done that. We know that feeling. It's a terrible one. And we thank you that you are so gracious to us. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you, ha- you bear with us, that you forgive us, that you take us back, that your grace is never ending for those who know you. But at the same time, Lord, here's what's in our heart. We don't want to take advantage of that grace. We love, we are grateful for your grace. But Lord, we would love to not live in such a way that belittles it. That makes it seem cheap but that we would recognize at what a high cost it came and that we would strive to please you more and more and obtain victory more and more in our faith as we live this life. We ask you for your powerful work and help, without which we are lost, but with which we know we can conquer. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Let us stand.